Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, licensed professional counselor. In today's episode, I have a very special guest, Dr. Dave, as he's known, from Shrink Wrap Radio, also known as Dr. David Van Nuys, PhD. He started one of the most influential psychology podcasts, and it was a huge part of my learning career postgraduate school, and it still is to this day. I enjoy listening to his excellent interviews with influential psychologists and counselors and academics from all types and parts of the field. And Dr. Dave is going to join me today on this episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. A little bit about Dr. Dave before we get started. When outside of the podcast, Dr. Dave, known as David Van Nuys, is an emeritus professor of psychology at Sonoma State University in California and served as that department's chair for seven years. The department has a long-standing reputation for its commitment to humanistic, transpersonal, and existential approaches to psychology, all favorites of mine. He has also taught psychology at the University of Montana, the University of Michigan, and the University of New Hampshire. He has served as a dissertation advisor for doctoral students at, Sa- at the Saybrook Institute and the Institute for Integral Studies, among others. David also runs a market research consulting business, which is www.efocusgroups.com, which has served a distinguished list of clients, including the New York Times, Apple Computers, IBM, Hewlett Packard, and Quicken Loans, among others. He was on the board of directors of the Qualitative Research Consultants Association and served as editor-in-chief for that organization's magazine, QRCA Views. He has also served on the board of the Humanistic Psychology Division of the American Psychological Association. David received a doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan and has worked as a licensed psychotherapist in both California and New Hampshire. He has led and co-led personal growth workshops at various centers around the United States and abroad, including Ireland, Kauai, Mallorca, Switzerland, and Sweden. Dr. Dave also periodically posts to his blog, The Happiness Dispatch, for the Psychology Today magazine. For a number of years, David also hosted another psychology interview series on topics of mental health, wellness, and psychotherapy called The Wise Counsel Podcast. Currently, these interviews can be found on his website. I would go to shrinkwrapradio.com and you'll probably find or just Google The Wise Counsel Podcast. In 2012, David joined the advisory board of the online journal, the International Journal of Neuropsychotherapy. In 2013, David was invited to post weekly selected episodes from Shrink Wrap Radio to the Armed Forces Network in the support of the U.S. service men and women and their families and U.S. government employees around the world. In 2018, he received an award from the American Psychological Association for his pioneering podcast. The award was presented at Harvard University by the American Psychological Association president before a crowd of several hundred educational podcasters. David has always been a person with a wide ranging hobbies and passions, which back in 2005 was podcasting, which he saw as the next big thing. Over the years, he has been involved in ham radio, sport judo, freight train hopping, yoga, folk guitar, recorder, piano, didgeridoo, skydiving, flying sailplanes, windsurfing, mountain biking, road cycling, motorcycles, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, and Tai Chi. David has made sure that the entire collection of Shrink Wrap Radio interviews will be available into the future by placing the whole collection in the nonprofit online resource, the Internet Archive. All right. Well, welcome to the Intentional Clinician, Dr. Dave. I'm really glad to have you on the podcast. Well, I'm really happy to be here. And I checked out your podcast a bit, and uh, boy, you've got a voice made for uh, made for radio, made for podcasting. Oh, so I congratulate you on that. Well, thank you. I uh, that's a very nice compliment. I started making my first podcast on tapes when I was in uh, when I was like five or six years old. I made a show with my brother. Anyway, <laughs> I don't have wow, any. You got an early start. Yeah, I appreciate that, and. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to welcome you and also say it's interesting to hear your voice off the podcast as I'm used to listening to you in my headphones Yeah, for, for years. And just kind of to introduce, if you haven't listened to Shrink Rap Radio, I'm sure by the end of this show, all the listeners, you will probably want to tune in. Um, I first discovered it, I think it was around somewhere around 2009, 
something like that. And I was working for social services in Arizona. And I, I was kind of at this place where I had to take these clinical trainings at the, uh, at the behavioral health authority office or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was getting very bored and I was, I was thinking I need to go to more conferences. I need to do some more things, but I, I, uh, it was kind of short on money because I was working in social services at the time sure. and had student loans. So all of a sudden I started, you know, on the internet search engine, looking up audio, you know, recordings of psychology and things like that. Cause I was finding myself, you know, I was reading some books, but I wasn't making as much progress cause I was tired. And all of a sudden I found shrink wrap radio. I think on the old school internet, I used to download it before the, all, all the apps came before the iPhone yeah. came. And so I just have to say, thank you so much for putting it out there because when I found it, all of a sudden I was so inspired. I was listening to episodes um, probably twice a week at least. I was catching up on your back catalog and learning so much and um, eventually buying books of people you had on and uh, ending up going to the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference and some other things uh, and getting involved with the Jung, uh, some of the Jung Institutes as well. Great. So. Right. Yeah, that's that's so good to hear because, uh, you know, when I first started podcasting in 2005, I which was the first year of podcasting, I like to let everybody oh. know, so I recently got an award from the American Psychological Association for being the first psychologist podcaster. And uh, it, that was very exciting for me. That happened this past November. And it, the award was given at Harvard University. I live in California, so it was a big deal to travel back to Cambridge and, and go to Harvard. And it was at a podcasting conference. And the president of the American Psychological Association, turns out she's also part-time faculty at Harvard. So it was convenient for her to come to that conference and give me this award in front of a whole bunch of podcasters. So whatever whatever uh, anxieties I'd had about uh, just being a little guy off on the periphery, it felt great to kind of <laughs> be on the main stage there and, uh, and getting that award was uh, felt like the culmination of, you know, of a lot of my work. Yes, that it sounds wonderful. And also I think well-deserved because I think, I think your podcast was such an influence and inspired so many other podcasters to make psychology podcasts and get psychology um, a little bit more out of the academia and into the application for the average person and and for the average clinician who was just looking for more outside of their grad program. So I'm I'm really glad that you got recognized there with that. Yeah, well, f well, I really have to thank you first of all for for liking it <laughs> and for letting me know that it was so useful to you because uh, when I started, I didn't have a clear direction. Well, I did. I had sort of a, a sense of what I wanted to do with it. I did not know that I would be doing it still 15 years later. And I didn't know whether anybody would listen because uh, podcasting was so new. Uh, there weren't any sort of ways to, advertise it or, you know, not that many people knew what podcasting was, you know, uh, uh, in those days you'd have to explain, you know, people's podcast, what's a podcast. And so I have to tell them what a podcast was. And actually that's kind of how I got into it was because I read uh, I, in a magazine somewhere, I saw a reference to Adam Curry, who was really the person who, helped to kick off this whole thing. Uh, and it talked about podcasting. And I didn't know what a podcast was. It's a podcast. I had an iPod. And also, I had been involved in amateur radio since my teenage years. So I knew about transmitters and radio and radio waves and all of that stuff. And I knew that my podcast, you know, or rather my iPod, now it's an iPhone, Right. But I, I knew that that little thing did not have it. Actually, the iPhone does have a transmitter in it, but right. the iPod didn't. And uh, so I, I had to find out about that. And, of course, what it turned out was that you could sort of have your own radio show without needing permission from anybody <laughs> right. and without needing to have much in the way of equipment. Uh, and so I thought, well, what could I 
you know, I, because I have been a radio guy for so long, that is an amateur radio guy, which is the conversations tend to be a lot more, a lot less interesting than right. we're having right now, I have to tell you, uh, because a whole lot of ham radio is people saying, I hear you loud and clear, you're five by nine, I'm running 100 watts out of a Halicrafters, whatever, right. goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> So a lot of the hobby is just being thrilled that you're able to contact somebody somewhere else, you know, initially in your neighborhood, maybe, and that's thrilling. And then later you're excited because you're able to do it in people in Japan and Russia and places all over the world. And actually it's for, for me back in those days, it started as a listener, kind of like with podcasting. So I could hear these hams talking and there's there is a a wing of ham radio in which people like to talk and and they will talk about whatever is going on in their life or that day or whatever and they're called rag chewers guys oh. who like to chew the rag and so there were some wonderful voices out there that i would hear as a 11 12 year old you know on this old shortwave radio that i had and I'd listen to these guys just talking and talking and kind of got to know them as listener. And then later, you know, one day when I was probably about 14, 15, I saw a kid at the library who was a couple of years older than me. And I saw that he had checked out this book on amateur radio. So I summoned up my courage and went up to him and said, are you a ham? <laughs> and he said, yeah. <laughs> right. So <laughs> then he, uh, yeah, I said, can I come to your house and see your stuff? And he, so he kind of took me under his wing and helped me learn Morse code because th that was one of the things you had to do to get a, a license from the uh, FCC. So I'm starting way back. <laughs> I know you yeah. can ask me about this, but that, in a sense, that's where it all started because. I had a comfort and f familiarity with electronics and technology. And so, and so I was curious, Hey, what is this podcasting? You know? So as I thought about, well, what might I do with as a podcaster and what occurred to me was I know some living in California as I have all these years. Uh, I know some pretty, strange and interesting psychologists. I could probably interview them. I could have an interview show. Well, that's kind of how it started. And I quickly used up my strange <laughs> people that I already knew. Right. And uh, uh, I've, there came a point where I realized that I could reach out to people that I didn't know. I actually read an article in the New Yorker by a professor at uh, USC, and um, I realized, well, I'm a professor, he's a professor, I could look him up. And, uh, you know, it's easy for a psychologist to find other psychologists. Right. And, and this was, uh, I guess we had the internet then, so yeah. Um, so, and and his, his uh, article was about kind of the psychology that happens around in and around politics and um, wasn't something that I was keenly interested in, but the article was good enough to be in the, in the New Yorker. And so I contacted him and he said, sure. And so, uh, you know, I interviewed him. I thought it went well. And then I realized with horror that, at the end of the podcast, I had forgotten to turn on the microphone. Oh no! Or, or the recorder, and it had not been recorded. <laughs> yeah. So then, I actually had to contact him again and ask if he'd be willing to do the interview again, and I would be sure to turn on the recorder. And fortunately, he was willing to do it. And. I'm embarrassed to say that I, I made that mistake maybe two or three more times in other interviews. And finally, I made a flight list, you know, like pilots have a flight list that they yes. have to go through, check everything. So um, I'm brave enough today. I still have the flight list, but 
I'm, I'm flying pretty solo <laughs> these days, for <laughs> trusting. But uh, actually, I put a little, I put a post-it note just up where the camera is to remind me, actually, that I must turn on <laughs> the recorder. Yes, that's, well, it sounds, I'm really glad you're telling me a little bit about the background and the background started when you were younger, curiosity about the ham radio. And then all of a sudden the technology evolved and you were obviously observing what was happening with the internet, but you're right. I mean, it's going from the control, you know, having to get on a radio show or have your own ham radio to all of a sudden, if you record a file and upload it, people can download it all over the world potentially millions of people if they had access yeah. could yeah it's could amazing download it so it's interesting yeah. that you were there that first year and yeah, the technology is amazing and and it just so happens that that was the year that i retired from university teaching ah so okay. i didn't even go through that sort of uh gap of you know, saying, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I've been teaching for 35 years, and now I'm looking at the maw of free time. <laughs> right. How I'm going to fill it. And uh, actually, in addition to teaching psychology, though, I'd gotten involved in market research. So uh -huh. I'm doing, uh, so that's another way that it fits, because, you know, it fits because I was a psychologist, psycho trained to be a psychotherapist, so talking to people and listening and trying, you know, and asking questions and trying to bring them out about their life, well, that was second nature for me. The other thing that was second nature is coming through the 60s, there was a period in which something called encounter groups was very much in, uh, a big thing, where, uh, and I became an encounter group leader. So it was a kind of non-therapy but group therapy kind of experience where people would try to let down their hair and get honest and raw about what was going on in their lives that influenced my psychologist career quite a bit because then i i got turned on to experiential learning and and try to make the classes that i taught in university as experiential as i could while still making sure that people had to read books and it would have some content and I would do some lecturing. But uh, so that, that was a big influence for me. And, th and uh, then I got involved in market research mm -hmm. and that was group interviews. I was doing something called focus groups that I hadn't heard of until I finally did hear about it, uh, which I can talk about that too. That's another story. But so there are those sort of three major uh, streams feeding in, supporting the idea of talking to people and, uh, and giving me some com you know, comfort with that notion. And, and, and I didn't get into using video until, I don't know, how, maybe five years ago. Or was, I had a friend who was kind of nagging me from the beginning saying, uh, or early on, for, he helped me get started too because I wasted most. 2005 was the, you know, if only I had started in January of 2005. Well, it was probably August when I finally right. got the technology. To, I had to design my own website, you know, and uh, and fiddle with equipment and try to figure out what kind of equipment do I need and all of that. And this friend of mine said, uh, you know, David, you, you, you got to get off the stick here. Just do it. Just do it. You've done enough preparation. So I summoned up my courage and I got started. So the same friend, after a number of years, said, well, you ought to be doing video. Seems like everything is going to video. And I said, no, no, no. This is video, you know. Uh, what I'm hearing from people is they're in the car, they're on a walk. Uh, they can multitask, and I still believe that. That for me, audio is still the main thing. But then I, you know, I finally thought, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. You know, I could go on YouTube and put it up on YouTube. So I started doing that, and slowly, you know, it's kind of built. I right now I have like maybe 951. I say maybe I know exactly <laughs> <laughs> because YouTube tells you right. actually. I think the last time I looked with 953 subscribers on YouTube. Now, I would guess, though, that there are a lot of people that look but don't subscribe. 
Mm-hmm. I hope. Yeah. And <laughs> so, I think so. Yeah, so that's when I, I started doing both, actually. I have kind of two vehicles, like the audio podcast, in which I offer commentary after the interview. Again, the, going back to that same friend, when I first started out, the word on the street was, in the early days of podcasting, was uh, no podcast should go for more than 20 minutes. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that was the idea, was that it was short form and you could only hold people's attention so long. And so 20 minutes was the gold standard. So, and uh, and so I was kind of doing short interviews, do the interview in, out. And then that same friend gets to me and he says, well, you know, David, I think that, I think people would like your personality. You got to get more of yourself in there. And so I wasn't sure how to do that. But I thought, well, I'll do a commentary about the interview at the end of the interview. So it kind of expanded these little components. And then people uh, were writing more in the early days. They would send me emails. So I made a section of reading emails. And then I made a section of picking out music and, and closing with, with uh, 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 what pod safe music, you know, that wasn't copyrighted. And so it's kind of evolved over the years. Well, I, I love that you're telling me about the evolution of how you began this because you started right in the beginning of, of the format. And a lot of it eventually, it sounds like also was somewhat inspired by old time radio shows. Like I'm going to read the mail and yeah, have a special right. musical guest and we have an interview guest. And it's yeah. interesting because I know that, you know, I guess NPR has a lot, had sort of longer form interviews. I think Terry Gross did that show. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, one of my, it's, I still listen to it. It's one of my favorites. Fresh and air. now it's available as a podcast. Yeah, oh, fresh yeah. Air. Fresh Air. So NPR has been a champion of podcasting. One of the first uh, companies, I think, to leap into it with both feet. Yeah. And so, and I, yeah, I love listening to their shows as well, but I think, it was interesting how your friends gave you feedback or the particular friend yeah. and it inspired and kind of made the show even grow into to what it has been kind of your standard format. And it's a, it's a decently long form conversation. Usually you said about an hour and yeah. I think it's super, it's very interesting because a lot of the episodes I've listened to, yeah, you have a very interesting guest, but then you have a lot of knowledge of psychology or experiential background. And so then you'll kind of come in with some ideas about, you know, have you heard about this or this happened or a story? And I think it, it makes it a lot. It just makes it an authentic conversation and um, adding video is even another element. And I'm not yeah. even huge into video yet. <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, well, you look good. You oh. look good on video. You're definitely, not only do you have a voice for radio, you've got a face for video. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm not too attuned to being on camera. I used to work. Uh, I actually worked at PBS, uh, during in my university years as a camera person. So I was behind the camera a lot and I like to twitch a lot. So I'm trying to not, yeah, I like to move around, you know, I'm, I got that frenetic energy yeah. going on. So the, I love podcasts because I can hide behind that a little bit, but the video I'm being challenged here. So I'm going to, I'm going to definitely put this one up. Um, yeah, but it's okay. You know, the movement is great actually. And yeah. You could, you know, you could pace, you could do whatever you want to do. It's your show. <laughs> I, I have to get those earbuds if I want to pace. So soon I will. Yeah, yeah I've got the earbuds. I've I got like the, I'm tied to the device with these things. Yeah. So I, and I, I love that you're sharing that because I, I feel uh, an attitude that I'm hearing coming out is this curiosity. And maybe that's, maybe that's something that, about why you became a professor and a market researcher and a writer. Um, you're just curious. I'm going to try this thing and I'm just going to do it. And I think that's an inspirational yeah. thing I want listeners to take, take a hold of. A lot of this starts with curiosity, trying it out, seeing what happens. And in the early days, you forgot to record a few interviews and maybe yeah. it didn't get popular right away. I mean, you were right there at the, at the forefront, but uh, you know, it, it became something that was inspiring thousands of people. Who knows? Maybe more. I don't know how many downloads you've had. And um, well, if we look over the period of time, I actually have, uh, there's a company that tells me that I've had around 5 million downloads over the 15 years. 
So that's good. <laughs> there you go. So I mean, maybe possibly millions of people who have downloaded or and and subscribed. So it's it's a, it's an amazing thing just from a small idea of the small. You know, you got taught it's a twenty minute thing. It's a podcast. People will download it, and that's it. To you know, influencing. Uh, and probably also influencing your life. And I've, I've heard, uh, I was going to ask a little bit about that, how, you know, your professor, you, you did all this writing and all these other things. And all of a sudden this podcast, I mean, I'm assuming takes off, um, yeah. so to speak, it became popular. I'm assuming people are emailing you. People are even wanting to be on the show. You're not having to go seek people at some point. Yes, exactly. Um, uh that's really become a big issue is people wanting to be on the show. I'm hearing from publicists all the time now, just about daily, uh, either authors themselves or publicists who are trying to uh, promote some author's book. And um, that's kind of hard. You know, I, I hate to turn people down, and, uh, but I can afford to be a, somewhat picky too. And, and uh, so, for example, I turned somebody down today. I think I've turned them down. Sometimes it's hard to, like, really in, in myself say, okay, I'm closing the door on that one. Mm -hmm. But uh, a beautiful Italian woman who was a supermodel, and now she's written a book on, uh, you know, a book on self-help and positive thinking and, uh, being creative in your life and all of that. And that's a hard one to say no to. Uh, yeah. But uh, so many books are coming out that are now that are saying essentially the same thing. Right. That, you know, there's so many books that are coming out now about mindfulness and, and um, so I'm being, I'm feeling a little bit more choosy and I don't want to, there are a lot of podcasts out there that are all too happy to go down the pop psychology path. Right. And I've got enough of the professor in me still that I don't want to totally lose contact with the movers and shakers in academic psychology and psychotherapy, counseling, you know, that, that whole side of things. So I'm trying to do a little bit of both. To, uh, to keep it going. You know, the, uh, as the sh I started off by saying that the 20 minutes was the, the word on the street. And what happened about the same time that my uh, friend was telling me to reveal more of myself, which I, as you can see, I don't have really have too much trouble doing that. Right. <laughs> if I feel, if I feel safe and comfortable and there's, there's an invitation there, I can, I can do that. But I started to hear from listeners that they wanted to hear longer interviews. They're saying, you know, I don't feel, I want more. And so that's how it kind of grew to be longer. And there are plenty of interviews that could be longer than the hour, but uh, my attention span is only about an hour long at best. So usually I, I feel good about just closing it off. Some have run longer. Excellent. And I'm just, I'm curious, actually, well, let's talk about a little bit about the content. Um, as you said, you, you're trying to balance it between some of the popular stuff and then keeping it in some of the academic and like what's really going on in the nitty gritty in psychotherapy and counseling yeah. these days. Do you have, maybe we'll go there for a second. Do you have some favorite episodes or guests or topics that, um, Come up that you'd like to share a little bit about for the listeners here. Sure, sure. sure. Um, you know, I have to. We have to put out there that I've done about a thousand of these now. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So I've got currently the count on shrink wrap radio is up to six hundred and fifty-two. I think I'm going to interview you this oh, coming that's right. Monday. So you're going to be, I think you're either going to be number 652 or 653. So well, I'm, congratulations. I'm, thank you. I'm very honored. I'm not sure how I got through to being on the list. Yeah, I'm telling I'm you. I'm excited yeah. about it. Yeah. People, they have to write a, uh, a, a flattering <laughs> request. You know, the fact that you are a listener, is, it's been exciting 
that there are people who've kind of come through the Alice in Wonderland mirror, you know, they kind of come to the other side. They started off as listeners, then they go to graduate school, then they write a book or something, and then they, you know, then they become a guest. And I've been doing it long enough to see it go through that whole cycle. I was like, like with teaching where, you know, first you're teaching people who are about your own age, and then pretty soon you're look, look, looking like their father. <laughs> <laughs> then pretty soon you're looking like their grandfather. And somewhere in there you're teaching their children are coming along. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's, that's fun. So just to finish the thought of, of a thousand, there was another podcast that I did for a while called Shrink, uh, called Wise Counsel. And the way that happened was I'm always looking for new things, new, new things to get involved in. And I'd been doing shrink wrap radio for uh, a few years. And I saw an ad in one of the psychological journals for somebody who was looking for a psychologist to, to, uh, to uh, help with some editing, I think it was. And so I contacted the psychologist who was running the ad and, uh, and I started talking about shrink wrap radio and he's, he's, Oh no. Oh, about the editing job first. He said, well, I just hired somebody to do that. And I said, Oh, that's too bad. And I started talking about shrink wrap radio and he got all excited and said, Oh, well, uh, because he was, he and another guy had put together a, a, what I would call a web portal. And that is a kind of a large website with a lot of different ingredients that was called mental help, mentalhelp.com or mentalhelp.org. I don't remember. And so they actually offered to pay me something for these interviews and uh, not a princely sum, but the idea of getting paid something was, was good. And so that uh, came, I came up with the name of wise counsel for that and it was much the same but without without the putting my personality in it other than it comes through in the interview itself ah okay so that gets the number up around uh, a thousand i think because i probably did about 300 episodes of that and um so there have been some uh some kind of thematic kicks that i've gone on yeah. uh, that reflected interests of my own so, for example, there's been, let me back up just a little bit before I go into okay, that. Sure. You can bring me back if I forget. Thematics, yes. The university that I taught at all those years was uh, a small university in California. It's a state-funded university called Sonoma State University. Mm -hmm. And it had a reputation in the beginning uh, for uh, it made its name in humanistic psychology, which at the time was um, was a hot topic. It was right after the human potential movement of the '60s. The school got started in the '60s. I wasn't there for the. I wasn't the first faculty person there, but I came in a few years later. And part of what it meant to me was well, it was a rebellion. Humanistic psychology was a rebellion against three other forces in psychology at the time, or maybe two others. I think, I think humanistic psychology was referred to as the third force. Uh -huh. The first one being psychoanalytic thought, which kicked the whole thing up, off, mm -hmm. and then behaviorism. So, but the critique was that... Uh, psychoanalysis had too pathological a flavor. Everybody was disturbed. <laughs> Everybody right. was running, suppressing their ids, you know, and had uh, horrible stuff. And, and that we were all neurotic in one way or another. Behaviorism seemed very mechanistic, particularly at the time. I think, I think behaviorism has evolved and behaviorists have evolved. But at the time, uh, B.F. Skinner, who was the, the uh, main person to start that school of behaviorism uh, was all about stimulus and response. And, um, you know, and that if you could understand 
all the stimuli, you could predict all the responses. And he started off doing that with rats and with pigeons. Mm -hmm. And certainly it evolved into working with people. So there was, amongst some of us, some of us who were inclined to be somewhat soft-minded, literary, artistically inclined, if you will, right. open to a world of possibilities. It just felt really too narrow a worldview of, for psychology. And so humanistic psychology sprang up, drawing heavily on uh, existential philo uh, philosophical thinking. And, um, and so it evolved into a thing that, that wasn't tightly defined, incorporated a lot that was coming in from, from the uh, human potential movement, um, all kinds of workshops, all kinds of new therapies, particularly in California, was quickly spread. And, and uh, so, and my, the thing that spoke to me about humanistic psychology was a lot of different new stuff coming online and uh, without necessarily needing to discard the old stuff. So my conception of what I wanted to do in the podcast was to give people a feel for my view of humanistic psychology and my experience at Sonoma State University, where I taught probably 10 or 12 different classes, you know, different titles. So I was encouraged. There was the freedom to teach whatever you wanted to teach, to make up courses. Wow. That's amazing. So I taught probably one of the first undergraduate courses in the country, I would guess, on uh, parapsychology, because you know, that was an exciting topic, interesting topic. I taught a class called Psychology of the Body, Psychology and the Body, where I would bring in body workers, people who were into therapeutic massage and, and rolfing and uh, Feldenkrais and all these things that were just emerging at that time and before the field was really large and respected, which is now, it's, it's particularly in Europe and other parts of the world, uh, there are all kinds of uh, legitimate body therapies. So that was my view of psychology, was that it should be very broad and Catholic. And so my attempt in Shrink Wrap Radio, and, and I've succeeded at it, is to bring a is to widen people's perspectives. And so I hear from students at traditional schools saying, oh, my professors don't talk about half of the stuff that you're talking about here. This is great. You know, they're all excited. And it's yes. helping them to be interested in psychology. And it's also been gratifying to hear from people like yourself who were in graduate programs, but they weren't getting as nourished uh, as they wanted to be. Uh, because often the particular program that they were in maybe had a very narrow kind of focus. You know, what we do is cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's it. And we're not going to tell you about the other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was very gratifying. Well, I do have some interests of my own, some jags that I've gone on. So one of the things that uh, I've been interested in Ever since I came to Sonoma State, where one of the faculty people was very identified with uh, the Jungian perspective, and he was very popular among students, and I got a lot of his thinking actually through his students who took classes from me, and, and you know, and I would hang out with them, and it got me sort of infected with the Jungian bug. And what I like about Jungian psychology is. Uh, you know, Jung started as a Freudian, but then he felt that Freud was, was obsessed with sexuality and that, uh, that there should be room in psychology for spirituality, for transcendent experiences, for uh, not, denying, not, not denying the darker side of humanity, but in drawing upon uh, mythology and fairy tales and all. And so that brand of psychology really appealed to me. And, and, the, and Jungians seemed like, I, I kind of put them on a pedestal as I started reading this material, and they seemed just really intelligent people with far-reaching minds, you know, yeah. who study 
archaeology and fairy tales and mythology and somehow incorporate all of this body of knowledge and so on. And part of it is you're encouraged to really find your true self, the idea that there's a, there is a, a seed, that we each have a, a unique seed that's our identity and that if it's nourished and recognized and, and fed, um, we, we have that opportunity to become our, our fullest and truest selves. So I like that idea. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm, I have actually, I don't know, I think it was partly your podcast that started turning me on to the Jungians. And I accidentally, honestly, this is, I'm saying this, I didn't really know who James Hillman was back in, I think, 2010. And I, I think it was 2010. Or 2009, I can't remember. And I actually went to the evolution of psychotherapy and I got into a small room with James Hillman and he just oh, talked really? for an hour about bringing soul into your practice. And yeah. my mind was blown. I, rem- I still can't find my notes, but I remember yeah. my, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, she was like, oh my gosh, you haven't stopped writing this whole hour. You barely looked up at him. I just was writing. And I remember just being so inspired. And then your podcast also had the union. So Ever since then, that's been a love of mine. It's kind of like, a, I don't know, it's something I go to because it's so broad, like you said, and also can incorporate what I've heard now termed as eco-psychology. And so I actually have an acquaintance who is uh, graduating from, oh, now I just lost the school in San Francisco. The one, oh, I can't remember. Anyway. It could be the... the um Institute of Integral Studies, um, Saybrook Institute. It's it's the right institute. One They're of them all, that's very associated with the, the Jungian yeah. stuff. It might be the right institute, and he's getting into eco psychology and taking people out in the woods and doing a lot of his sessions there, and then doing sessions back in the office. And I've been very intrigued and inspired by that. So I'm glad you talked about that because I find that even when I'm, you know, when we're working with your average person who maybe isn't interested in that that material, bringing that, reading those books and hearing the podcasts of the people you've interviewed has influenced my practice in a way that, and my own personal life in a way that's so enriching. Um, And just even if I take little trinkets from that and and bring it into maybe, you know, more empirically, whatever I have to do to, you know, help people, uh, you know, do you know, within the box, you know, if they're not open to that material, yeah. it, it is certainly cr- helps with creativity and influence. Um, even though I'm not, I'm not a Jungian, and I haven't gone to their institutes, but I've gone to their seminars. I haven't either. I haven't no. either. And right. one of the things that's been really gratifying to me is that I'm able to talk to them and to have um, a good conversation, one that I'm not somebody who uh, who ha- tends to have a big ego. Uh, I have suffered a lot of self-doubt, you know, in my life and over the years. And so one of the benefits for me of um, of being of doing this podcasting has been to uh, get a lot of validation, both from listeners and from the people that I'm interviewing. And uh, and I take that in. I mean, I've, I'm not going to aw shucks it and, and discount it. I'm going to take it in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One of the things I've learned, you know, as a psychologist is take it in mm-hmm. and let it nourish you. Let it, let it touch your heart and, and, and uh, you know, and grow with it and, and uh, be willing to, to uh, trust that and to move forward from that place. And so one of the most gratifying thing, you know, because here I am at this little unknown school in a corner of California. And uh, now I, I have to give credit to the University of Michigan. So I have, uh, having gotten a PhD at the University of Michigan, which is a high status school, not easy to get into, very demanding. Uh, so I have that you know, I, I can use that as a calling card. And evidently, even though I was very rebellious as a student, <laughs> and did not apply myself as hard as I think I would today, uh, there's stuff that got in there that I'm still drawing upon that allows me to 
talk to leaders in the field across a, a, a lot of the different facets of psychology. One of the ways that I, I had put myself down, I think, uh, and I remember there was a faculty evaluation where we were supposed to do self-evaluate ourselves for promotion to uh, for tenure and all of that. So in a small discussion group of my catalog uh, with, with my colleagues, and I said, well, I'm a dilettante. And one of my wonderful colleagues, you know, repositioned that and, and said, you know, he repositioned it more as, a, a generalist, somebody who, that there is a valuable place for a generalist are needed who can be interpreters, if you will, across a broad number of categories. And um, oh, I'm going to block on this word. The, the person in the, in, a, in the museum who... The shows, curator? Yeah, curator. Yeah. Thank you. I see myself as a curator. Oh, uh, I like that. Yeah, I like that too. I only came to that a few years ago, but but that, I think that really fits the, I think what I'm doing and kind of how I see myself. And I'm blown away that I can, that I've tended to downplay my own intelligence, but somehow talking to intelligent people draws out, <laughs> calls upon whatever intelligence I have. And uh, so that's just been very gratifying. So, so the Jungian, I've interviewed a number of Jungian analysts and people who are, but they're both the Jungian analysts and the Jungian fellow travelers. I think I see myself mm -hmm. as a fellow traveler. And a spinoff of that is a longstanding interest in dreams. Um, so there's a lot of stuff on dreams. Uh, uh, I did, when I went to Sonoma State, that Jungian colleague he had been doing dream groups in having students share their dreams, uh, their nighttime dreams, uh, keeping journals, and working those dreams to figure out what they might mean. Uh, very much influenced, I think, by Jungian thinking. And so I summoned up the courage uh, after some years to do my own version of that class, which mm -hmm. I did for many years. And so a lot of the interviews have been around dreams and dreaming. Altered states of consciousness is another thread running through uh, the shows. Uh, I was in graduate school in the 60s. That was the time of um, major psychedelic experimentation that was going on. Uh, I'm now bold enough to admit that I was uh, taking part in that and uh, because, and it, seemed to me as a psychology graduate student that it would be a way to better understand uh, psychosis and uh, sort of extreme states. And um, so now that whole thread is coming around again in, uh, with a lot of a big resurgence of research into the use of psychedelics in uh, psychotherapy. Yes. And, and so I'm doing interview. I'm following that pretty closely. I haven't had a psychedelic in years and years and years. So just to set everybody at ease. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I'm very interested in that approach. And as it's happened, one of my sons is a, uh, has become a nurse practitioner. And he's in a training to become a trip sitter. That is somebody who will under legal, supervised, medical setting of, of uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, he will be somebody who can be with people who are in that state. There's actually a training program in San Francisco, a graduate training program <laughs> that he's in. So <laughs> well, it's incredible. The, I mean, I've just seen some preliminary results on psilocybin working with yeah. people that were near the end of their lives and looking at their test scores of depression pre and post one or two sessions. It was incredible. Yes. I mean, these right. are smaller studies, but still, I mean, the results were very encouraging and uh, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I, I love that you're talking about all these themes and the generalism because I really identify with that. I've always tried to figure out what is my thing. And I even, yeah. even now I'm doing a lot of trauma informed because that seems to be what the need is here where I live. But I'm so, you know, I'm always interested in other things. So I'm glad that you're, 
you're taking that identity because I think you being a general, a person who likes lots, gets interested in lots of different themes, that's amazing because you can translate because a lot of people go to their little camp and they stay there. And yeah. you can be informed by what you're talking about right now and Jungian and all these other things and still and and still also, you know, have a session where you do solution focused therapy discussion. You know, I mean there's and, and family therapy. You there's there's cross the cross pollination I think is needed. And so I'm glad that you're talking about these themes and 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 embracing the general knowing about a lot about different types and not yeah. putting yourself over here only. I think because of uh probably because of the drug thing that was going on then, the psychedelic thing back in the 60s. Uh, I was interested in psychedelics, but uh, part of what came through that cultural phase as well was Eastern spirituality. So I got very interested in yoga and you know, started doing yoga, later taught yoga. Um, my doctoral dissertation, I was also interested in other altered states, including hypnosis for a long time. I did a master's degree uh, in which I uh, tried to learn as much as I could about hypnosis. So my doctoral dis dissertation was on the role of attention, which turns out is a huge topic today that can be dis explored neurologically scientifically yes. with brain scans and all of that. So it's a major topic, but in 1970, it wasn't a major topic. The role of attention in hypnosis and meditation. Oh, and Somehow I got that <laughs> for the university of Michigan. There was no other <laughs> dissertation at all like that. And somehow I got that through. Yes. So, you know, so those interests are still there. You know, there've been, uh, definitely interviews with people around hypnotherapy and what's happening in that corner of the world. Uh, lots of, and uh, now mindfulness is such a huge topic. That's, that's the topic du jour, along with PTSD, trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, uh, those are huge topics today. And so lots of interviews. So those are two other big threads that run through. And then and then the other thread is trying to be open to and hear about, uh, provide a platform for people to talk about a variety of therapeutic approaches that at this point may be considered a little bit marginal. Yes. But it's not that I have no filters. I mean, I don't want to give the, the wrong impression here. There is still that sort of some of the more conservative, conservative academic in me. And so I'm not, you know, there are podcasts that will, <laughs> that will interview anybody about anything and, and they'll, mm -hmm. you know, and I just, I have some boundaries. I'm not going to go to all the, every far out thing and whether it's a gift or a curse, I can't say, but uh, I've never been able to be a true follower what I am, and this isn't the greatest thing for a psychologist, like I had, uh, a psychotherapist maybe, uh, I'm an enthusiast. <laughs> yes. I get very enthusiastic about things, and that enthusiasm will carry me in, and, uh, but then I'll either get tired of it, or I'll, I'll see that, uh oh there's a dark underbelly here, and as I become aware of that part, then uh, I may drift away. Yeah. Well, it's, that's hearkening back to the curiosity element though, because I think yeah. I, you know, you've got to be aware and uh, it's important to be aware as a therapist or just as a person that there are, there are trade-offs to approaches and techniques and theories. And there's also sometimes, like you said, a dark, there can be a dark side or a shadow to it. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sure there is. It just depends if you notice it or not. And so I, it's, I'm glad that you're, you're talking openly about that. Well. Yeah, I, and I guess we all, I, I, I'm aware in myself, and I don't know how universal it is, but I'm always, um, there's always a part of my mind that's doing opposites, you know, that it's hard for me to hold one perspective and not hear the other side of it, not see the other side of it. Well, actually, I think that's, 
I, I'm hoping that's more common. I, I think that uh, it is well needed. <laughs> Recognize that. Culture, yes, and that there's always an opposite. And, and that's something I learned yeah. a lot from the Jungians, but also I learned a lot from trauma therapy about how the, the body or the nervous system will overcompensate and go the other way. Or, and, and, and uh, you know, if you're, I won't get into all that, cause this is your interview, but essentially the, the concept of having, being able to hold two opposite opinions in your mind is, a, I think, something that's got to be developed. And to see that there's value in both on some level, and there's light and shadow in both on some level. That's one of the things I value about the Jungian perspective, and you've articulated it really well there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I, so there's a lot of threads, a lot of interests. Uh, you're an enthusiast. Um, oh, oh, you, you. I know that you wanted to ask me about some of my favorite interviews. Oh, yeah, I was, and that's really hard to do. I have to say because yeah. I've done so many now that. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes I've had somebody contact me and I don't know if I've interviewed them or not. And that's kind of, a, well, you know, it's like meeting people, you know, that you've, uh, that you've known and you run into them at the movie theater and it, it, there's this awkward space where you can't remember their name. Well, actually, let me reframe the question. How about some ed- episodes that are exciting to you that you think maybe a person who's never heard Shrink Rap Radio might enjoy because yeah. I think I was just thinking about this. You've been podcasting for almost what fourteen years now, it's right? A, yeah, fifteenth year. And you've yeah. taught so many people that actually, I was thinking about for you, a podcast might just be a regular conversation almost at this point with a little bit more formatting. This is like a thing you do all the time. So to ask you to pick a favorite is is pretty. It's quite a thing. So maybe just what would be interesting for a new listener who's just trying to get involved with your show. Well, the first thing they should do is go to my website instead of just going to a, I mean, you could just go to iTunes and look up Shrink Wrap Radio and subscribe to it there. But I'd really like you to go to the website and see what's there. Uh, because one of the one of the drop down menus is the best of Shrink Wrap Radio, which another one of my friends <laughs> encouraged me to do. David, you have to get, there's too much. Yeah. So, so that's a good place to start. You'll see a list, and I've got, I've got, uh, I can tell you the topics on that list. And uh, and if you see me looking off to the side, it's because I've got the best of on a monitor here, so I'm looking away from the camera. Okay. Uh, so in the A's, autonomic nervous system, addiction, ADHD, archetypal, artificial intelligence, autism, brain science, children dreams, exercise, forgiveness, gratitude, grief, and ritual, history, humanistic psychology, Jung, LGBT, LGBTQ issues, meditation, memory, men's issues, mind, mindfulness, myth and fairy tale, neuropsycho, neuropsychoanalysis, neuropsychotherapy, neuroscience, parapsychology, positive psychology, psychotherapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, Psychology of pain, resilience, sleep, synchronicity, technology, trauma, William James, wisdom, yoga. Now, those are the categories. And under each of those categories, I've tried to list generally one, two, or three episodes. Some have even more than that. So let's see, picking out uh, some of my favorites from that, I'll have to put on my glasses to really get down to that level. Um, There are so many to choose from here. I'm not, um, I got to move this window to see the full thing. Uh, I really like episode number 293, a Jungian approach to fairy tales with Tom Uh. Lisner. so that's a good one. I believe I remember that one. Yeah, good, yeah, good. I believe so, because I remember the fairy, it got me into it, and I bought a book on fairy tales because of that. Uh, number 330, Unlocking the Emotional Brain with Bruce Ecker, M.A. He opened up the door to an extremely important theoretical 
thing in psychotherapy about the way memory encodes emotions and emotional events and that it's possible to reprogram the brain to some extent to reprogram memory mm. uh, I'm, I'm sure it could be stated more elegantly than that but but his work has uh, turned out to influence a whole lot of other people yeah uh, humanistic psychology I mentioned and I've been talking about it Number 360, Rediscovering Humanistic Psychology with Jessica Grogan, PhD. Well, guess what? I don't think she's, I don't think she's even a psychologist. Maybe she is. I'm not sure. If she is, she's into the history of psychology. Right. So it was delightful to get a young, she's a young person. She's like just finished her PhD. She's probably in her late 20s, right? Mm -hmm. And so she went through the whole humanistic psychology thing and did a lot of research on it. And uh, it was wonderful to hear it from an, a, quote, naive set of eyes coming back and looking at it, warts and all. Hmm. And she said, actually, that she ended up wishing that she had been a student in those days and that she would have liked to have done that. So that was, of course, really gratifying. Uh, there's a British psychoanalyst who I love interviewing him by the name of Professor Brett Carr. And I've interviewed him several times. And he's, he's such a gentleman. He, one of his books is, is, this is episode number 567, Tea with Winnicott. Hmm. Now, Winnicott is, is one of the major figures in the, in the evolution of a psychoanalytic thought. And, um, and Winnicott has written both a book where he dialogues. He's somebody who's written a major deep biography of Winnicott. So then he has written this more popular level book uh, where he dialogues with Winnicott. Of course, knowing everything about Winnicott that anybody could know. And so he gives, it's written as a, as a chat but they get together and they have tea and so on. And he's written a similar book on Freud. And again, this guy has, uh, he's such a scholar. He's both, he's a scholar, he's a psychoanalyst, and he's uh, an accessible human being. Just a delightful guy to talk. To oh, that's talk. great. And, and he, he expresses such appreciation for me, which in turn, that's why I have to love him as much as I do. Yeah. And here's another interesting little thing that podcasts opens up. I've developed a good friendship with a person who introduced me to, to interviewing Professor Carr. Oh, you must talk to Professor Carr. Mm -hmm. this, this person at the time was a graduate student in Tehran, Iran. And we've become pretty close. Uh, we uh, we get together on video on Skype from time to time, and you can imagine uh, how terrible things are in Iran right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we're making them more and more of an enemy, and the average person, such as this young man who who is uh, becoming a psychoanalyst, he has been in training to be a psychoanalyst. And uh, they have to stand in lines to get food and basic necessities mm -hmm. and so on. And still he manages to be cheerful. And uh, uh, so, uh, so podcasting can open up not just listeners, but also the possibility of developing relationships with people in distant parts of the world. I had hoped that it would open up lots of, of uh, workshop opportunities for me to travel and do lots of workshops. For whatever reason, that only happened once hmm. where I got to go to Stockholm and do a dream workshop. And uh, I met some wonderful people and I loved the workshop. And so that's podcasting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, we've, we've talked a lot about podcasting. I appreciate you sharing some of those favorites and I actually think for the listeners, I would just, I think that is a good place to start instead of subscribing, check it out. Shrink wrap radio, the best of shrink wrap radio. And if you haven't heard the show, check out some of the interviews there. 
And it seems like, you know, a lot of my questions I was thinking about before the episode, you've kind of answered naturally just about um, how it's influenced your life and, and how things have changed and how um, you've met different people and learned different things. Um, and it sounds like, I, I guess, to ask a question, I mean, assuming you're just going to continue uh, doing this podcast, is that what? What's your I plan? think so. I've I've started to have you know to to, uh, to wonder about retiring from podcasting, but it's still so nourish, nourishing to me that uh, you know I've even toyed with the idea of selling it mm-hmm. uh, if I could find the right person. But I think a lot of it is really pretty much attached to my personality. Uh, so. So I don't know. It's, it's, I've contemplated it a little bit because uh, there's a lot of preparation. In fact, you know, you said it, by this time it's probably just, you know, sitting down and chatting with another person. But I actually prepare quite a bit. Just about everybody that I interview has written a book. And I'm doing an, an interview a week. And my eyesight has gotten better, uh, worse <laughs> over <Right>. time. <laughs> that was a wish. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah. The opposite. <laughs> yeah. So uh, reading is actually very challenging, and it's hard wow. for me to do the reading that I would like to do, that I feel I should do. Uh, fortunately, I'm I'm a pretty quick study, so that I can doesn't require a whole lot of reading for me to kind of get to the gist of the idea. So I can still do that, but I, I worry. And memory is a bigger issue, and sometimes I would like to reach for a historical figure or something and it's eluding me Mm. that can be a little bit embarrassing but for now yes i will be continuing forever (laughs) well great i'm 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 glad to hear that because i think uh i'm glad as long as it's helping you you're helping lots of people and i think it's it's great to get it out there and a podcast a week that is that is an intense schedule considering the number of books and things you may have to prep actually that was just thinking about that because I actually do about once a month and I find yeah. that because I'm in full-time practice and directing a clinic, I find that to be very intense because I want to make sure I really prep and think about the podcast, like you said, uh, before. And I'm still, I'm still, I'm having to write things and that's harder and harder, but I write a monthly newsletter for mm-hmm. shrink wrap radio. So uh, I, I always write an essay myself and then there are other elements. Uh, I've got, a strategic relationship with uh, uh, a a podcast, a website called the Jung Platform that I've had for years. And he sort of handles a lot of the mechanics of the newsletter, but but I always write this essay. I've got an affiliation with a group in Australia called, uh, they've renamed themselves. They were uh, put out a, a a magazine called the Neuropsychotherapist. Now mm. they've brought their efforts to something called uh, the uh, the science of psychotherapy. Oh, and they now they have a podcast. Now they've become podcasters, but they've just decided to uh, create coursework. So I've just created my first course through them that people could get for thirty dollars. Really, it's on uh, PTSD and trauma and the way i'm doing it with their encouragement is i'm drawing from three different interviews on that topic and not not playing the whole interview Mm -hmm. but providing a kind of a study guide pulling out the key concepts and so on and then for a number of years i've been working with uh, the zur institute which is a place where people in the field can get CE uh, credits, continuing education units. And so I've got about 100 units worth of study through, uh, through them. So those other sorts of activities also <laughs> take up time. Plus, I've got six grandkids, four adult, four adult kids and six grandkids. So there's a lot <laughs> to keep me from. And I haven't really quit doing the market research. It's oh. slowed way, way, way down, but my website is still there. So yeah. every now and then somebody knocks on the door. So that's it. And we've gone about my uh, attention span. Oh, yeah. 
we are just <laughs> we're just reaching that. I really appreciate your time and being on the show, Dr. Dave. And uh, thank you so much for your honestly for your contribution. It uh, I, you know I never met you before today, but we've emailed a little bit. But honestly, it changed the trajectory of my entire career and focus. So postgraduate school. So I, I appreciate the show and that level personally, and I'm sure it's helping lots of other people as well. And I wish you, um, I'm glad to hear about your full life that you're living right now. And it's wonderful. So, um, you know, best to you and good health to you as well. Well, the same to you. And thanks so much for this opportunity. Well, there you have it, folks. That concludes my interview with Dr. David Van Nuys of Shrink Wrap Radio, also known as Dr. Dave. It was quite an honor to interview Dr. Dave as his podcast, as I said, has been a huge influence on my career by introducing me to so many distinguished and interesting um, clinicians, psychologists, and academics. And I can't thank him enough for what he's done for our field and especially those of us. I mean, as I said to him at the beginning, I was on a budget. I didn't have much money to go to trainings, especially 10 to 12 years ago when I started listening to the podcast. So uh, I've always admired Dr. Dave. I've sent him some emails over the years, thanking him and uh, pledging actually to donate to his podcast, which I think people should. It's such a valuable resource. Um, and so it was just awesome to be able to do that. I feel a great connection with him as he's very into so many different types of things. And that's... Um, I think part of my personality is I'm involved in so many different things. I don't often talk about on this podcast, like music and um, different philosophies and outdoors activities. And I won't list the whole thing, but essentially I really identify with that personality he's got where he's just so interested. As he said, he's an enthusiast, which I, I love. I think that's kind of what I feel like I am. And I love connecting people to different things and I'm excited about, life and my on my good days so thanks so much for listening to that episode coincidentally i believe uh dr dave mentioned this but uh, i will also be a guest on shrink wrap radio coming up very soon so you can find that by searching my name and shrink wrap radio to hear dr dave actually interview me which is quite an honor um honestly i don't have a book published or anything and uh i'm not a distinct distinguished academic so being on his show is an uh, is, is amazing opportunity, uh, really, so I thank him for that. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon the literature they have read and their experiences in the field, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 right now or call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. If you are in need of counseling, don't hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can find them usually uh, by going to psychologytoday.com and looking for, up different therapists that way, or you can just Google it. Um, and you could also call your insurance company if you have insurance. You can make an appointment with uh, one of my associates by going to healthforlifegr.com. That's Health for Life Grand Rapids, or by typing into your search engine, the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids. If you're looking for electronic medical records that are dependable and reliable, I recommend Simple Practice. If you are interested in trying out Simple Practice, I will have a link in the notes of this episode for a 30-day free trial. If you utilize this link, you get 30 days to check it out and see if you like it. If you decide to subscribe, my podcast will receive a small referral fee. So I thank you in advance. Even if you decide you don't like simple practice, I appreciate you clicking on the link. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, I wish you good health and the courage to soldier on.